All who meet its gaze are killed on the spot, their flesh turned to stone. And where its horrible body slithers, all plants wither and die in its presence. The Basilisk is an ancient mythological serpent that has been written about for thousands of years. From the Roman author Pliny the Elder to the English medieval monk the Venerable Bede, and they even feature in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales and were referenced by Leonardo da Vinci. For a fictional creature, people really had a lot to say about the Basilisk. But for those of us who want to draw on that history and mythology in our Dungeons and Dragons campaigns, how can we evoke that idea of the Basilisk in our games beyond just what the Monster Manual stat block gives us? Let's find out. Ahoy uh, everyone and welcome back to the channel, I'm Nazir North and today we are looking at the infamous Basilisk. Tales of the Basilisk have been told for well over 2000 years and the accounts vary on both their physical appearance and their features and abilities. The Basilisk has also been incorporated into various forms of modern media. Possibly one of the most well known is the gigantic sewer dwelling reptile in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. In this video we're going to be looking at how the Basilisk was described in history, how it's presented to us in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, and how you can incorporate the Basilisk into your campaign and run it effectively in combat. In the last portion of the video we're also going to do a little home brewing to create a legendary Basilisk variant, as in my opinion the 5e Basilisk is a little lacklustre, so make sure you stick around until the end if you want to see my take on the Basilisk. Let's start off with some historical accounts. We'll start on appearance, physical form and behaviour, and then we'll have a look at supernatural abilities. Pliny the Elder describes the Basilisk as a relatively small serpent with a crown shaped white spot on its head. Basilisk translates from Greek to mean something close to Little King, so we can see there where it gets its name from. In size, Pliny describes it as 12 fingers or Roman digitus in length. This is an odd measurement for us, but best I could work out, this seems to be around 9 inches or 22 centimeters, so not really very big at all. If anyone knows more about Roman units of measurement, please tell me if I've gotten that wrong. Feel free to correct me in the comments. Pliny also says it doesn't move like a normal snake but moves upright at the middle. I'm not exactly sure what this means but now all I can picture is Randall from Monsters Inc. Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales also includes a basilisk in one of his stories. Chaucer's basilisk is described as more physically intimidating than Pliny's tiny little snake and it is said to have a mix of features from a rooster and a turkey with the tail of a snake and the eyes of a frog. Chaucer also portrays it as a guardian of a treasure hoard. That is useful information for us who might want to use it in Dungeons and Dragons. Later tales tend to make the basilisk larger and larger until we have something a bit more like the interpretation from the Witcher series where it also has the ability to fly. On behaviour, we also have the one and only Leonardo da Vinci describing it as a ruthless, cruel creature that seeks out other animals or people, or when there are none around, even plants, to kill. This implies it isn't just a creature that kills for food or for self-defence, it just kills for the sake of it, maybe even for fun. As some final notes on its form, in Cantabrian mythology the basilisk supposedly has a beak and legs, so contradicting some of the older, more serpentine descriptions. Some modern scholars speculate that the basilisk myths might be from real world cobras, and that's where they may originate. And then of course in the modern age there is a whole genus of lizards that have been named after the basilisk myths. That's the genus of Basiliscus. Okay, next let's talk about the basilisk's supposed supernatural abilities. Starting again with Pliny, who said, All who behold its eyes fall dead on the spot. That's a very dangerous ability for a creature to have. Pliny also says that when the basilisk hisses, all other serpents fly from it. Now, I'm assuming he means fly as in flee, although he could also literally mean fly as in fly, as people back then did believe that flying snakes existed. Pliny then talks about its noxious influence, seemingly caused by its breath and other bodily fluids. This influence supposedly spreads around the creature and kills plants and even cracks rocks. Supposedly this influence was so potent that if a rider killed one from horseback with a spear, the poison of the basilisk would travel up the spear, killing both the rider and the horse. 
A few hundred years later in England, we then have the Venerable Bede discussing basilisks around the 8th century CE. Bede talks about basilisks being born from the egg of an old cockerel, which is odd as cockerels don't lay eggs. He does however attempt to bust the myth of that death stare. He says that that deadly ability is more likely caused by a corruption of the air, maybe via some kind of poisoned breath or other odour that the animal's emitting. As time goes on, things do tend to become a bit more outlandish, with the basilisk apparently gaining the ability to breathe fire, being able to kill just through touch, and even through just the sound of its voice. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, well what about petrification? What about their ability to turn people to stone? Well, this is actually where things cross over with the mythological cockatrice. In many of these myths and stories, the two are often used interchangeably, and traditionally it's normally the cockatrice which is associated with petrification, not the basilisk, and even then only in relatively modern stories. The oldest reference I could find to a cockatrice having petrification powers is from The Worm Ouroboros, a fantasy novel from 1922 by E. R. Edison. If anyone knows of an older reference to petrification from the cockatrice or the basilisk, let me know in the comments, I couldn't find anything. Of the sources we do have, many of them also talk about the weaknesses of the basilisk. A common one is weasels, where they were sent into the basilisk's den to kill them, although sadly the weasel also usually died in this process. The weasel is mainly used in the older stories where the basilisk is still relatively small. Although, interesting point to remember, we do have the giant weasel in the monster manual in D&D 5e, so something to bear in mind. Some of the sources also say that a basilisk can be killed when it hears a cockerel's crow, and some of them also talk about certain plants that can be used to detect the presence of a basilisk, and they change colour if there's one nearby. And finally, the one weakness which we've seen in countless stories to combat petrification, from Perseus and the Medusa right through to Hermione Granger in Harry Potter against that version of the basilisk, and that is mirrors. Stories tell of how mirrors or other reflective surfaces can be used to avoid the deadly glare of the basilisk, or even, as told in the Canterbury Tales, to trick the basilisk into killing itself by gazing upon its own reflection. Alright, now we have a good grasp on the basilisk from myth, let's have a look at what the 5th edition D&D Monster Manual gives us. The first thing to note here is the form of the artwork. No beak or bird-like features, although it does actually share a loose resemblance with Randall from Monsters Inc. Maybe I'm onto something there, or Wizards of the Coast just had the same interpretation of Pliny's description as I did. Anyway, the Monster Manual adds a few new unique things to the Basilisk mythos. It says that the Basilisk actually consumes the creatures it petrifies, as they turn back into organic matter when mixed with the Basilisk's digestive juices. Those juices then give a possible alchemical solution for a cure to petrification if they can be safely harvested. As the area near a basilisk's lair may be littered with partial stone statues of animals and people, this makes it a little bit like a pantry for the basilisk. It preserves its meals in stone so they don't rot and decompose, and it can return to eat them later on. This actually makes a lot of sense from a survival perspective. The entry also tells us they tend to live in arid, temperate or tropical climates, meaning they probably don't like the cold, and it says they're often encountered underground, in caves or sheltered lairs. Basilisk eggs are highly sought after, as a basilisk raised from an egg can supposedly be domesticated and trained, even to the point where the basilisk is smart enough to avoid the gaze of its master so it doesn't accidentally petrify them. This is quite advanced behaviour for what we've assumed up until now is just a raging killing machine. This implies that they can function as relatively safe and even possibly affectionate and faithful companions and pets. I actually think the Monster Manual entry here is really insightful, and my only real criticism of the 5e Basilisk comes from the stat block, which as we'll see shortly is mainly geared towards a low level party. Let's have a look through it. The Basilisk is a medium sized monstrosity, that all makes sense with what we've learned so far. Its alignment is given as unaligned. Again, this is really interesting as many monstrosities in 5th edition are usually given evil alignments 
and unaligned is usually reserved for beasts, animals that have a real world equivalent. This further hammers home that point that they could in theory be trained and taught to follow and behave in any type of alignment. Its armor class and hit points are okay for its challenge rating which is 3, but its speed is only 20 feet. I get that it doesn't need to actively hunt, it just looks at its prey, but the range of its gaze is only 30 feet, so that low speed is still a bit of a hindrance. But I suppose if you were running the Basilisk as is, you could use its action to dash right up to the party. It doesn't rely on its action for that gaze effect, so it can easily spend it on a dash without really losing too much. The Basilisk has good strength and constitution, but is pretty weak across its other ability scores. It has dark vision, which aligns with what the entry told us about it preferring to live underground, but it has a pretty awful passive perception score of just 9. Now we get to the Basilisk's defining feature, Petrifying Gaze. Creatures in range that look at the Basilisk have to, in effect, fail two separate con saves in a row to become fully petrified. A creature can choose, however, at the start of their turn to avert their gaze so to just look away. This is the smart thing to do, although it does mean your attacks against the Basilisk will have disadvantage. And the Basilisk will have advantage against you, as you are effectively blind to it while averting your eyes. I do really appreciate that the end of this ability also states explicitly that the Basilisk will accidentally petrify itself if it sees its own reflection, mistaking it for a rival. This is obviously here to give the players a chance to plan and act intelligently to counter the Basilisk's gaze. Although it does also tell us a little bit more about its potential behaviour. The fact it mistakes itself for a rival implies that they are probably solitary and territorial creatures. So if you were raising basilisks from eggs to sell for domestication, you may want to keep them separated in captivity, so you don't just accidentally end up with a pen full of stone statues of basilisks. And last part of the stat block, it has a basic bite attack which also does a little bit of poison damage. That's just another callback to its medieval descriptions of possessing that deadly venom. It is also possible here that there was some inspiration from the Komodo dragon, not just in the bite action but also there in the artwork. As the Komodo dragon is known to bite its prey and then just wait for them to die from the venomous bite. Alright, given what we now know, how might the Basilisk behave in combat? What are its tactics? They are going to be pretty simple, as it's not a particularly smart creature. It will stay near its lair, or its burrow or den, wherever it lives, and probably not wander too far, as we can assume from the fact it would target a rival that it's probably quite territorial. In fact, you may even find a scattering of other petrified predators, or maybe other petrified basilisks, marking the edge of a basilisk's territory, in places where it's fended off the competition. Even though it has a low dexterity score and no stealth proficiency, I feel as though the basilisk would at least try to attempt to hide from its prey before striking. And because of its low speed, it's more likely that prey wanders into the basilisk's view, rather than the basilisk going out of its way to actively seek them out. It lets its meals come to it, not the other way around. And as we know from the monster manual description, it probably has plenty of half-eaten meals just lying around if it wants a snack. It doesn't actually need to hunt all that often. Compare it to something like a wolf or a lion that has to expend a lot of energy to catch fast moving prey. The basilisk doesn't need to do any of that. It can afford to be lazy most of the time. When it is in actual combat though, it's likely going to want to use dash action to rush right up to its opponents and do its best to stay within that 30 foot range of as many of them as possible to trigger its petrifying gaze as often as it can. Any opponents who decide to avert their eyes are going to be the main target of the basilisk's bite attacks, which it will then be able to make with advantage. If you want to be extra mean when you run a basilisk, you could have it use its action to begin eating an already petrified foe mid-combat potentially causing a party member to lose a limb or worse. You could also have some other kind of hazard on the battlefield that could risk smashing a petrified player, something like a falling tree or a rolling boulder. Use these tactics with caution though, you don't really want to TPK a level 1 party with these moves. Reserve this kind of stuff for hardened, more experienced players. If you want to see my video on dynamic battlefields and more of this kind of stuff, you can check out the card in the corner now on what I've called the effort system.
system. When it comes to allies as solitary predators, I can't see an encounter of multiple basilisks really making a lot of sense, unless perhaps it was a nesting mother with her young brood of juvenile basilisks. And for that same reason, I can't see them working alongside other beasts or monstrosities. Where we could see them, however, is as a companion to almost any humanoid or otherwise intelligent creature who has bred, trained and domesticated them. Planning a bandit encounter on a bridge where they're extorting a toll from travellers? Give the bandit leader a pet basilisk on a leash. Planning a raid encounter of a goblin camp? Give some high-ranking goblins a basilisk or two. Maybe even saddle them up and let the goblin use it as a mount. This is really where I see the Monster Manual's version of the basilisk shining in its role in combat. Not so much as the simple, there's a monster plaguing the village, go find its burrow and kill it type quest, but more as effectively a guard dog to a wide variety of different foes. This could be supported by an entire black market economy of basilisk egg trading and dealing. You could even have an entire subplot that is all about the party unearthing the details of this egg trade and bringing down the smugglers and illegal breeders, maybe even gaining their own basilisk egg as a reward in the process. As far as I'm aware, there is only one other official type of basilisk in D&D 5e, and that is Matt Mercer's Swavian Basilisk published in the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. I'm not going to go into that monster in detail as I want to keep these videos relevant to the DMs who just own the core rulebooks as you can't expect everyone to dish out hundreds of quid on all the various source books there are now for 5th edition. But as a brief summary, Matt's version is quite different to what we have in the Monster Manual, although is clearly still inspired by it. It's aquatic and it's more like a sea snake, so no legs on this one. The main difference though is that it doesn't have that petrifying stare. It instead secretes this sort of petrifying oil through its skin that triggers the saving throw if you touch the creature or try and hit it with a weapon attack. A little reminiscent of the story we had from Pliny the Elder of the rider on horseback stabbing the basilisk with a spear and still succumbing to the deadly poison. This version in the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount is still only a challenge rating 7, so not an incredibly tough foe, although the prospect of fighting it in the water does make it a little more dangerous if the party aren't prepared for that. If you're enjoying this video so far, please let me know by hitting that like button, and if you want to see more content like this in the future, be sure to subscribe to the channel as well. I'm also currently taking submissions of your original art for the channel. If you want to get involved you can send your original drawings or sketches to nnviewersubmissions at gmail.com where I will be taking your monster drawings and concepts and turning them into homebrew stat blocks for D&D 5e. Alright, on with the video. Bringing together everything we've learned so far, what might we want from a homebrew basilisk? What gaps are there left from official content? Personally, I think we could do with a higher CR legendary variant of the Basilisk. And I'd also like something which draws more heavily on some of the mythological descriptions of the Basilisk. Here's what I've come up with. For the artwork, we have something that is more heavily influenced by medieval descriptions with some of those bird-like features but also that crown-like white spot that Pliny the Elder talked about. We have four legs, a vicious hooked beak on the end of a long neck with a snake-like tail. We've also incorporated some of those fins and sails from the real-life Basiliscus lizards. For the name, I've gone with the Vicovian Basilisk. Just like Matt did with his Swavian Basilisk situated in Wildmount, I've named this Basilisk after a region from my own homebrew campaign setting. Vicovia in that world is an Eastern European inspired nation. If you want to check out the map I made for that world, I'll add the link to the screen now. On the stat block, I've made it huge in size and chaotic evil. Da Vinci said that they just want to kill things on a whim pretty much just out of spite, so that sounds like chaotic evil to me. It's got a 40 foot movement speed, it's got four limbs, a streamlined body, and it's a big creature, so I think that speed makes sense in context. It's got good physical stats, and then I've modelled its mental stats after other hunting predatory monstrosities from the Monster Manual, like the Owl Bear, for example. This Basilisk is going to be doing some grappling, so it's got proficiency with athletics. 
and compensating for what the basic basilisk lacks, it has proficiency with perception and stealth. This allows it to act as a stalker or an ambusher when it's hunting its prey. It's going to have some abilities that deal poison damage, so I've given it resistance to poison along with immunity to acid damage. As we'll come to shortly, it secretes acid from its scaly body, giving it that ability that Pliny spoke of, being able to melt or break rocks as it passes. So it needs that immunity so it doesn't just dissolve its own body. I've also given it immunity to the poisoned condition and the petrified condition. So you can't pull a sneaky mirror trick on this one. That might work on the lowly CR3 basilisk, but not this guy. My logic here is that if the basilisk's own body is capable of returning petrified creatures back into digestible meat as it swallows them, so it must have some kind of anti-petrification effect either in its blood or its stomach so it would make sense that it would be immune to petrification. I've left the dark vision in, although of course this version has a much better passive perception score. Next we have Petrifying Gaze, which I've left mostly unchanged from the base version. The key differences here are a slightly increased range. This is to reflect that this basilisk is larger and its head can be higher from the ground, meaning it can meet the gaze of its foes from further away. It also has a higher DC for the saving throw as we'd expect, and as we've already covered, it can no longer accidentally petrify itself. It then has an acidic secretion feature, which a little like the Wildmount Basilisk, damages all those who touch or are grappled by it. It also leaves a trail of acid on the ground when it walks, killing all plant life and damaging any creatures that walk across it. This means that the battlefield can change as the fight goes on and as the basilisk moves around, making more and more of the terrain dangerous to stand in or move through. With this feature, I was also thinking about adding in something like the rust monster has, where non-magical weapons and armor would be damaged by the acid. But the stat block is already fairly busy, so I've left that out. Also, a lot of its abilities already punish marshals and close-range characters quite heavily, so I don't think it needs that extra feature as well. But you could, in theory, add it in here. I think it does make for a good thematic fit. Its noxious influence feature calls again on those historical accounts of claiming the basilisk could contaminate the air around it. The trait itself here is borrowed from creatures in the monster manual like the Ghast and the Troglodyte, who have a stench effect, forcing nearby creatures to make a saving throw or become poisoned. Okay, on to actions. It has a powerful multi-attack option which potentially allows it to use both a breath weapon and a regular weapon attack in the same turn. It's got a bite which, like the basic basilisk from the monster manual, does some additional poison damage. I've also given it a constrict attack which it can use with its tail. This is very similar to the giant constrictor snake in the monster manual. However, for our basilisk, it will have that extra effect of adding that ongoing acid damage as the creature is in contact with its skin while grappled. And finally, as attested to in some of the historical sources, a poison breath attack. Modelled here in the stat block after a young green dragon from the monster manual. However, as some of our sources talked about the basilisk's ability to breathe fire, I've added some extra detail to this. The gas it exhales is highly flammable and will ignite if there is an open flame nearby, dealing some extra fire damage not just to the foes in the cone area of effect, but also to the basilisk itself. Looking at some of these features from the acid trail to the flammable breath, this is definitely a monster you would want to gain intel on and learn more about before you come into contact with it. So if you run this one in your campaign, make sure you give the players the opportunity to gather some lore and other information about this basilisk before they have that final showdown with it, just to give them an opportunity to get creative and come up with some solutions to counter the abilities of the basilisk. On to legendary actions. But as a quick note first, I've decided against lair actions for this basilisk as I imagine this one, unlike the sedentary, burrow dwelling basilisk in the monster manual, more of an active hunter, moving around the wilderness actively searching for food. I think an encounter with the party will be away from any lair that it might have, either where it has stalked and attacked the party or where the party have laid out some kind of bait or trap to attract it somewhere else. Okay, legendary actions. This first one is pretty basic, it just gets to make a bite attack. 
The second is a leap. Given it some mobility off turn to move around the battlefield and given opportunity attacks made against it disadvantage. But because it is jumping through the air, not moving around on the ground, it's not leaving any extra acid in its wake. I think that being able to jump over players and rain acid down on them would be a bit too much, even for this creature. The last legendary action, however, is quite a mean one. Like many legendary monsters that have a move legendary action, the Basilisk can use Slither to move off turn. However, if it has a creature grappled when it does this, it drags them through the acid as it moves dealing damage for every 5 feet it drags them. This can rack up the damage really quickly. If the party see one of their teammates get grappled by the Basilisk, they know they need to get them out of their ASAP, or this move is just going to shred them. And there we go. Altogether, this is a pretty deadly monster, one which will be a difficult challenge even for some higher level parties. Ranged attacks and magic will still stand the best chance against it, but anyone in range of its gaze and various acidic and poison abilities are going to be in for a rough time. Any party members that close to the Basilisk are probably going to be making multiple con saves every round against the Basilisk's various abilities. But maybe the risks are worth the reward. Not only might there be a bounty for the creature's head, but you could also allow the party to attempt to harvest some of the acid or flammable gas from the creature for later use. Or maybe some other parts of the body like the blood or stomach juices for alchemical concoctions. Maybe there are specialist traders nearby who will pay good money for it. And maybe if you are feeling super generous as a DM, they could be guarding a treasure hoard like the Basilisk from Chaucer's Tales. Or perhaps there is a perfectly preserved Basilisk egg left over that the party could take and raise as their own. I'll leave the rest to you to work out for your game. Now, if you've been following some of my other homebrews, you've probably noticed I tend to create higher challenge rating creatures. And that's just because I think there is a real gap in higher level play in D&D 5th edition, where parties get more powerful, and it's hard for the DM to push them and challenge them appropriately. So if you've got a party that's around level 12 or 13 that's getting a bit too cocky, a bit too big for their boots, maybe they walked all over the last big bad guy you threw at them, give this Basilisk a try, see how they do. Let me know in the comments how they fare. Alright, that is all for this one. You can find the link to the Homebrew Basilisk in the description below if you want to get hold of it for your own game. And let me know in the comments what monsters would you like to see next. I've been loosely working through the alphabet so far with these last few monster videos, but I'm open to suggestions. If there are any popular picks, I will focus on those ones. If you haven't already, remember to give that like button a click on your way out and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on future videos. Cheers everyone, I'll see you next time.